Our next speaker will be Professor Zoltan Somboti, who is uh, head of the Department of Arabic Studies at the Eötvös Loránd University in Budapest. And uh, he is also a research fellow at the Avicenna Institute of Middle Eastern Studies in Hungary. He has been a visiting scholar at various research institutions in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and he, uh, his research interests are pre-modern Muslim social history and folk religion. He has also published studies on Muslim societies in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, and he is the author of The Roots of Arabic Genealogy, a study in historical anthropology, which was published in 2003. Um, he has works about Guinea Bissau uh, on the history of Bidini and Kaaba, uh, and uh, Muslim libertinism in medieval Muslim society in Arabic, Mujun, Mujun, libertinism. Today, Professor Somboti will uh, speak about the cult of ancestors in Muslim societies, some notes on Goldseer's Le culte des ancêtres et le culte des morts chez les Arabes. Please, Professor Somboti. Thank you. So, first of all, um, words of, of thanks words of thanks to the organizers of this wonderful event and especially for uh, the opportunity to take part in it. Um, uh, despite the fact that I am, I am certainly not an expert on the uh, oeuvre of uh, Goldseher, but then the extraordinary breadth of uh, the, uh, the interests and uh, the, uh, the scholarly um, curiosity of, uh, of Ignaz Goldseher is a well-known fact, uh, and that makes it almost impossible not to link uh, any Arabist's work to, um, or any scholar in, in, his, uh, in Islam, not to link his own work to, in some way to uh, Goldseher's uh, oeuvre. Uh, now, uh, the cult of ancestors in Muslim societies um, in, uh, in 1884, Ignaz Goldseher published an important article in Revue uh, de l'Histoire des Religions on the, the cult of the ancestors and the related but distinct uh, uh, cult of the dead among the Arabs of the pre-Islamic and early Islamic periods. Of course, he was generally interested in, in popular religion in Islam, um, uh, various aspects of it, but uh, this, this is part of uh, that, that general field. Um, now, in this work, he notes uh, the Prophet's efforts to suppress certain manifestations of this sort of religiosity, especially those aspects that appear to compromise uh, pure monotheism. Um, however, uh, from the late Middle Ages on, um, Islam uh, spread to many uh, parts of the world in which uh, uh, cults of uh, the ancestral spirits were deeply rooted and took many forms, uh, such as uh, possession by and communication with and sacrifices to the ancestors, uh, veneration of their graves, and, and so on. Many, many, many forms of such religiosity with uh, each of these aspects provoking different kinds of uh, objections by Muslim jurists. Now, in this talk, I, I would like to explore the ways in which Islamic jurists and ordinary Muslims have negotiated the tensions between an Islamic textual tradition derived from a Middle Eastern context and ancestor cults rooted in ethnically and culturally very different settings, very different from the kind of setting that, uh, that Goldseher um, talks about in his, in his article. Um, Based on Goldseher's original observations, Muslim uh, um, juridical texts, and more recent ethnographic data, and that includes my own uh, fieldwork uh, that I conducted a few years ago in Sulawesi Island in eastern Indonesia, I wish to test the translatability of certain religious concepts within a culturally and ethnically heterogeneous uh, Muslim world 
and I use this very specific, it's, it's a very specific context uh, as an example for wider uh, lessons, hopefully. Um, but then, if, if we talk about ancestor cults, then it, it's necessary first uh, of all to define what we mean by uh, the term cult of the ancestors. So, cult des ancêtres, the term that he got, uh, that got in her, uh, uses in his very title. <coughs> and this is particularly important because uh, when I uh, read uh, this uh, article by, by Goldsinger, it uh, became uh, instantly obvious to me that he understands the term very differently from the way I do. Uh, and I should also say from the way most uh, contemporary ethnographers are, uh, are likely to do. And it's important to be aware of the difference and, and to point to this difference in, in the understanding of the term itself. Um, Goldsinger apparently defines the cult of ancestors very broadly, in a, in a very broad sense, uh, as, as just about any, any sort of uh, expression of honor paid to, uh, the, the, to the dead by their descendants and says that in his conception it differs from the related concept of a cult of the dead only in degree. Uh, the cult of the ancestors, in his view, focus, uh, focuses on, on those generations who died in the more remote past, and the cult of the dead is a term that he uses for, uh, for the veneration of, of more recent generations among the, uh, the, uh, among the dead ancestors. So for him, it's just a matter of degree, not, not of kind, the two phenomena. Now, being as it is explicit, it is fair enough as it is, but a uh, more usual definition of an ancestor cult uh, would be, uh, I'm afraid, uh, far more specific than that. To uh, cite an everyday, very accessible uh, definition, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary offers uh, this brief definition of the term ancestor cult I quote, uh, a ritualistic system of veneration, honor, and propitiation of the spirits of dead ancestors for the purpose of avoiding evil consequences and securing good fortune. Now, this is, this is already um, um, far more specific than Goldsinger's understanding, but usually ethnographic uh, definitions will also stress the presence of many other aspects as well typical constituent features such as uh, belief in continuing interaction between ancestral spirits and uh, their living descendants. So uh, an ancestor is not just anyone who had uh, died a long time ago, but someone who, who has turned into a spirit and uh, continues to interact with the uh, descendants. Um, also, um, there is usually the necessity of regular sacrifices and other ceremonies to, uh, to honor or placate the dead ancestors or ancestors, the idea of ancestors turning into tutelary spirits that protect their descendants and if not properly honored, uh, also harm them. And often the possibility of communication with ancestral spirits, which I have already referred to, uh, and, and very often part of these cults is uh, uh, the idea of possession by ancestral spirits. I mean, the idea that ancestral spirits can and will uh, enter the bodies of their descendants uh, in certain ritual settings. Um, and this more common ethnographic definition is the one that I will adopt and use here uh, in, in this talk. Now, in the light of this working definition of ancestral cults, uh, let's briefly review the relevant data presented in uh, Goldsinger's art, uh, article. So what does he present as, as manifestations of uh, the cult of ancestor, ancestors among uh, uh, pre-Islamic and early Islamic uh, Arabian populations? Now, he first notes the, uh, the insistence of pre-Islamic Arabs on following the tradition or sunnah of their ancestors as regards both practices and beliefs. Now, this is conservatism or traditionalism, and uh, one which any ethnographer will instantly note is hardly unique to uh, pre-Islamic Arabs, but he considers it as a form of veneration towards the ancestors. 
And he further points out that uh, uh, the pre-Islamic uh, Arabs had a habit of swearing by the names of their uh, dead uh, tribal heroes, ancestors, and they would sing praise poems on their dead tribal heroes. They would also erect uh, on sob or stele, funerary, funerary uh, grave stele, uh, around the graves of certain uh, uh, tribal ancestors, usually tribal heroes, noted for their uh, prowess in, in war. Um, and by the way, the Quran, uh, he, he also notes that the Quran condemns the veneration of Ansab in Surah 5, uh, Ayah 90, although here the term, uh, if, if we look at the Quranic text, then the term doesn't refer to funerary stele in particular, but to any stones of uh, cultic significance and veneration and, and the object of veneration in general. Now, um, Goldsinger also notes uh, uh, that pre-Islamic Arabs uh, regarded the graves of famous heroes as, as sanctuaries in some cases. And this was closely linked to the belief that the personal virtues of the deceased remained operative after uh, his death and might also affect visitors to his grave. And then animal sacrifices in honor of the dead uh, were also sometimes made, uh, often quite near or next to the graves. And that is, that is more or less all that he presents in his, his uh, article regarding the uh, uh, cult of the ancestors. So that, that's all we have there. And uh, I noticed, and, and I think you have noticed too, that these elements obviously do not form a coherent uh, form, a coherent cult of the ancestors as, as defined in an ethnographic sense, very far from it. Indeed, uh, even by Goldsinger's broader understanding of the term, they hardly measure up uh, to form a, a real cult of the ancestors. They are just disparate, uh, they are just sort of a conjuries of uh, disparate elements not necessarily connected with one another. Um, and uh, also, they also betray a rather, and of course there are great lacunae in, in our knowledge, uh, but, but still they betray a rather inchoate idea of the fate of the dead after death, and even less clarity about the fate of uh, remote ancestors as opposed to recently uh, departed ones. Now, of course, we might wish to add other elements from sources other than Goldsinger's study, um, from modern studies, such as uh, Haddad and Smith's important book, The Islamic Understanding of Death and Resurrection, which has a wonderful, very good uh, appendix that deals with pre-Islamic ideas of the afterlife. Um, and we might also look at primary sources, such as Ibn al-Kalbi's Kitab al-Asnam, everyone uses that, or al-Shahrestani's Kitab al-Milal wa nihal Ibn Sa'id's Nashwat uh, al fi Tariq Jahiliyat al Arab, and so on. Uh, so there are several sources which we might further use to uh, compare with uh, the material in, in Goldsinger's uh, article. However, even a combination of all these additional sources adds up to a very meager collection um, of disparate and hazy beliefs uh, that certainly doesn't mention the label ancestor cult in any strict sense. For instance, uh, Al-Shahrestani's summary of the religiosity of pre-Islamic Arabs mentions almost nothing, next to nothing whatsoever, that could be associated with a genuine ancestor cult, however rudimentary. Um, all in all, um, Goldsinger is, is well justified in making his, his verdict that notes uh, the absence of a genuine ancestor cult among the pre-Islamic Arabs. He, he actually makes this verdict, not, very in, not in a very definite way, but he, he does say so, and it seems to be justified. He uh, compares the cult of ancestors among pre-Islamic Arabs to that among Asian Greeks and Romans, and he states, now pardon my French, uh, it's, it's very poor, but I will try to to render it. On cherchera en vain une pareille adoration des ancêtres chez les Arabes, à l'exception du moyen des Arabes du Sud, chez lesquels on a constaté un culte des ancêtres plus développé. And uh, 
So at least for the northern Arabs, for uh, the, the central and northern part of the peninsula, he says that uh, he, he says not quite explicitly, but he says that we don't really have a genuine ancestor cult. So uh, it's thus perhaps fair to conclude that the title of Goldsiher's article, or at least half the title, the first half of the title is something of a misnomer, as it would be really hard to label the data he presents as forming a genuine culte des ancêtres uh, among pre-Islamic Arabs, uh, even if we allow for his loose definition of this concept. Um, and I might add that in their book uh, on death and resurrection in Islam, Smith and Haddad also make a similar conclusion. They observe that, uh, uh, and I quote their text, it seems certain that no real communication between the living and the dead was considered possible. Spirits were generally thought to be quite different from human souls. So there was a sort of difference between the two kind of beings. And they cautiously conclude that the term ancestor worship is, is perhaps not or not necessarily applicable uh, in a pre-Islamic Arabian context. So other authors uh, come to very much the same conclusion on the basis of, uh, of uh, different material to the one that Goldsinger reached in his uh, study. Now, since the cults of ancestors in the proper sense, in any proper sense, do not seem to have been a characteristic of pre-Islamic Arabic-speaking societies, at least in Arabia, it is perhaps not surprising that such beliefs and practices are barely discussed in either the Quran or the canonical hadith corpus, with the exception of a few usually ambiguous Quranic verses and hadith, which I'll return to uh, shortly. The juridical literature of the formative period doesn't contain several, uh, separate chapters or even sub-chapters, titled sub-chapters on the topic, and neither is it a particular concern in the popular medieval Arabic works on the fate of the souls after death, such as uh, Al-Ghazali's Ad-Durr al fakhira Ibn Qayyim al jawziyas uh, Kitab al-Ruh, or as Suyuti's works, uh, Bushra al-Qa'ib, uh, Biliqa al-Habib, or Sharh uh, al-Sudur, Bihal al-Mawta al-Qubur. And this relative lack of concern can be generalized to an even broader circle, sphere, it's been noted that while the fate of humans during and after the eschaton, uh, that is to say the last judgment and paradise and hell, is elaborated in great detail by the fundamental sources of Islam, by contrast, the fate of human souls between death and the eschaton is remarkably uh, undefined. Uh, the few Quranic references to this period, which I'll discuss later on, are vague and open to varying interpretations, as I will also try to show, uh, and it's uncertain and controversial, for instance, where the human spirits or souls uh, dwell during this period, whether and in what particular ways they are able to interact with the living, such as in, in dreams or uh, near their graves, and how, and whether any such interaction is unidirectional or not, and so on. But you observe that this period between death and uh, resurrection is precisely the crucial period for uh, the development and flourishing of operation of, of ancestor cults. So that is, that is the period when the ancestors are supposed to be active and interact with the living. Um, now, this was not a notable problem as long as Islam was practiced by populations that had no real well-developed cults of the ancestors, as I have uh, said, but has given rise to heated controversies, very notable, really, really remarkable controversies in more recently Islamized societies in which such cults did flourish. Uh, and this, uh, I am referring in particular to uh, Muslim societies in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast uh, Asia where these cults are really widespread, ubiquitous. Uh, and my next point to which I, uh, I wish to turn now is a brief overview of the various forms of the veneration of ancestors and ancestral spirits uh, in, in these particular Muslim societies. And of course, it's just a very uh, quick uh, overview of uh, what we typically find in these societies. So uh, the basis is 
uh, tends to be a belief in ancestral spirits, of course, and the idea that the souls of dead ancestors turn into spirits that remain active in this world. In this world, that's, that's important. Um, a corollary of this idea is that these ancestral spirits have special dwelling places often uh, in, in this world, again, such as sacred trees or uh, graveyards, uh, certain special structures, and so on. And this will often lead to uh, the building of ritually important structures over ancestral graves, regular ritualized visits to the ancestors' graves, and sacrifices or offerings and other ceremonies honoring ancestral spirits. Uh, they tend to be regular and performed regularly. And uh, there are many ways in which the ancestral spirits can make their presence felt and uh, interact with their descendants. Um, so many, if not most, ancestor cults will um, include the idea of possession by ancestral spirits, uh, an uh, spirits entering the bodies of their uh, uh, descendants and taking control. And in West Africa in particular, uh, ancestral spirits may express themselves through uh, uh, masked uh, interme intermediaries, hence the ubiquity of uh, masking cults in some parts of West Africa. Now, founders' cults uh, are a form of ancestor veneration widespread in, in Southeast Asia in particular, where the ancestors of the founding lineage of a settlement or a, a state merge with the local spirits of the land and become the object of special veneration. In, in this way. And I would like to, uh, to give you a very brief, a really very brief illustration of uh, how such a typical ancestral cult uh, proceeds uh, from my own field research, uh, which, uh, which studied uh, a ritual in eastern Sulawesi Island called the Molabot Tumpe, uh, which is a yearly offering to uh, the Sultan's family, the Sultan's dynasty in the local Bangai Sultanate by leaders of a tributary settlement. Now, so far, there is nothing having to do with, with an ancestor cult in it. But because of mythical precedent, um, this, is, this is a ritual necessity to, to offer this to the sultans. On, and unless it is done, then the, the ancestors are going to be angry and visit uh, misfortunes on, on, on their descendants. Uh, the, the main item of the offering is, is, is eggs uh, of an endemic local bird called Maleo. And uh, this is a multi-day ritual. By the way, I, I show you a, a picture or two. Um, so here you see incantations made over the offering. Uh, then uh, it, it, this is a multi-day ritual. Uh, the eggs are, uh, are uh, taken to a house of rituals, then, then uh, in procession taken to, uh, taken to other places. Uh, and the whole ritual takes place in various locations, including shrines in the jungle near the local ancestors' graves. This is another link to an ancestral cult. Um, and uh, uh, the main link to the cult of the ancestors is that possession by the spirits of the, the ancestors is the sign of their satisfaction uh, with the successful completion of the ritual. And possession takes place individually as well as, well as, as communally on a great massive scale at various stages during the rituals. You see here uh, the offering being taken to the Sultan's wooden palace. Okay, um, this is going to, uh, to come shortly. Um, now, it is now time to turn to the issue of how these societies uh, placed uh, such traditions in the general framework of Islamic discourse. Uh, because these are Muslim societies. This, this particular one in which I, I, I made my field work has been Muslim for at least three centuries. So it's, it's not a very recently Islamized uh, society. Um, now, given the lack of obvious precedence in the early period of Islam, I, I, I talked about this earlier, uh, it's perhaps not surprising that the issue is quite controversial and it will be instructive to observe the ways such societies would cope with the need of uh, uh, justifying, legitimizing these, uh, these cults within an Islamic uh, framework by finding textual justifications uh, for their views. 
Um, now, I, I, I wish to single out uh, one particular aspect of the cult of ancestors for, uh, for closer scrutiny for, for constraints of time, and that is, uh, that is possession, the idea of possession by ancestral, uh, ancestral spirits. Um, and then I will more briefly touch upon the related issue of the idea of reincarnation of uh, ancestral spirits in their descendants, if time allows. Um, now, the idea of, um, of um, ancestral spirits uh, possessing their, uh, their uh, descendants, this is what I'm going to talk about now. Possession by spirits, which is usually rendered in Arabic as sara'an, wrestling down, pushing down, uh, is generally accepted uh, as a possibility in Muslim juridical tradition on the grounds of certain Quranic passages and hadiths. This is one of them. You see it here. الذين يأكلون الربا لا يقومون إلا كما يقوم الذي يتخبطه الشيطان من المس. المس, touch, Satan's touch is usually understood uh, in in uh, exegesis as as referring to uh, to sarah, uh, possession by by a spirit. Now you also have uh, this God is addressing the Prophet and says, You are not a madman. This is the important part, but this, this is literally uh, someone possessed by a spirit. And this is the way most, uh, most uh, exegetes uh, would uh, elaborate on this. So uh, uh, the, the, the idea of possession is OK. It's, uh, there's no problem with that uh, in uh, in uh, Islamic uh, legal and uh, religious discourse. The idea of possession by ancestral spirits in particular is, is another matter. It's, it's, it's a uh, far more controversial matter. Uh, the idea, as I said, has always been widespread in, in uh, Southeast Asia, even among Muslims. And uh, uh, here, not only local ancestors, but the spirits of famous historical heroes and even Muslim uh, religious figures are often regarded as forever active in this world and uh, capable of possessing people. Uh, for instance, in, in the Malay Peninsula, you will find shamans or pawang often claiming to be helped uh, and often possessed by the spirits of um, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib or Abdul Qadr al-Jilani and so on. So various Muslim uh, personalities. Um, in fact, there is even an, a, an expression, Manrun Sheikh, calling down a sheikh, which is a common synonym for possession by a spirit. Um, and uh, the ancestral spirits of Batui town, where I conducted most of my fieldwork, also include Muslim religious figures, early missionaries of uh, Islam in the area, area, such as a man from the Hadramaut called Sheikh Jabbar, who is buried as an ancestor near the town. And my informants in Sulawesi, participants in the procession, uh, didn't seem to be troubled at all by the issue of, of possession by ancestral spirits. Uh, apparently regarded that it as uncontroversial that uh, the possessing spirits were ancestors um, who showed their satisfaction in this way, in, in this dramatic way, at least dramatic for me, because they, they, they were really apparently quite comfortable around possessed uh, people. This is just a quick photograph. I couldn't make a, a clip, but, but you see the onlookers, they are just unfazed by the fact that this man is, is, is being possessed by an ancestral spirit. Um, but it was dramatic for me every time I, I, I saw it. Um, and indeed, ancestral spirits were present and active in other ways. Uh, in other ways uh, as well during the proceedings. For instance, they would show their support for a faction within the local community by smuggling an extra egg, extra Malayo egg, uh, overnight into the house of rituals to show uh, their support for, for a, uh, a faction. And uh, this was advertised with much fanfare by the faction privileged. Uh, this was the Lur Ajayib, the miraculous egg they kept bringing me there and saying, just look at this. 
record this. This, this is the sign of the support of the ancestors. Uh, now, more Sharia-minded Muslims may be far more concerned with the dogmatic implications of possession by ancestral spirits, because it's, it's not unproblematic at all. Uh, thus, a Malaysian Sufi author offers the following cautious assessment. Um, you can read it here. I, I won't read it out all. Now, normally, the causes seem to be unknown. Uh, some people think that possession is caused by female ancestors in particular, Saka. And then he says, most of these cases are not caused by, by ancestors, in fact, but, of course, as you see at the end, there is a certain proportion of patients who are indeed troubled by female ancestors and such like beings. Just not all of them are to be diagnosed as being so, okay? So it's, it's a possibility, it's no, no problem, says this, uh, this Sufi author. Um, and then he goes on to recount cases that he personally witnessed in which a patient was afflicted by female ancestors in particular. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, the issue of why female ancestors and not uh, male ones. Um, and uh, he, he says that these are very problematic cases. There are some mixing, of, uh, there is some mixing of, of pre-Islamic and, and Muslim traditions in these uh, healings, which should not be done. But he, he, he is not, he doesn't dismiss the possibility of, of possession by a, uh, uh, an ancestor uh, out of hand. And then elsewhere, we find the same author denying this possibility in the same work, uh, in very, very uncertain, in, in very certain terms, observing that many Malay shamans claim to interact with the spirits of Abdul Qadir al Jilani and comparable figures. He states, this is the, the text that he, he has here, which he offers here, such claims are total lies in Islam, an already deceased person's spirit or soul, ruh, that's a problem how we understand this word, but this is generally used in Southeast Asia in reference to ancestral spirits, ruh or arwah. They will never return into its body, let alone into the body of another person. There is absolutely no hadith from the Prophet Muhammad that would confirm that the souls of men who have died would ever return into their bodies. There can be no doubt then that the confession or claim of the presence of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, Hang Tua, that's a local hero, and so on, by the shaman in his possessed state is one way of the shaitan or jinn to lead people astray. And then he, he uh, quotes a Quranic passage that he says uh, is, uh, underlines this. This is the Quranic passage. Uh, this is open to varying interpretations and originally has nothing to do with, uh, with possession or ancestral spirits, of course, but this is, this is what he thinks uh, uh, about this. Now, this is the general view of, uh, of Salafi or reformist uh, discourse in Southeast Asia. Uh, there is no possession by, by ancestral spirits. No, that's not a possibility. And the main textual evidence for Salafi and other reformist Muslims uh, in this respect, comes from Quran, uh, Surah 23, uh, Ayahs 99 to 100. That's a very famous uh, passage or verse. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمْ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ رَبِّ إِرْجَعُونِ لَعَلِّ أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِيمَا تَرَكْتُ كَلَّا إِنَّهَا كَلِمَةٌ وَقَعِلُهَا وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخُونَ إِلَى يَوْمٍ يُبْعَثُونَ بَرْزَخْ that's the key word. Uh, there is a barrier behind them, Barzakh. Now, it's important to note that this verse originally had a totally different context. It discusses the importance of doing good deeds while it's not too late, since one won't have a second chance after one is dead. And it's fairly obvious from the Quranic text that the barrier, or Barzakh, is to be understood as a kind of separating line between the living and the dead. But then the exact nature of how this separation 
takes place is unclear and it is open to varying interpretations. For instance, in Asyuti, uh, Asyuti's works, we find two different and very, very different interpretations. Uh, in, in one of his works, he says uh, that some form of interaction with the living is still possible and the soul of the deceased might be present, quote unquote, among us in some unearthly sense, not in the usual sense, but somehow. Uh, the mainstream interpretation seems to have excluded the possibility of continuing activity of the souls of the dead among the living. And uh, uh, for instance, we find in the Tafsir al Jalalain uh, that, uh, uh, I'm quoting the text, returning to life in this world is impossible forever after one has departed it. So the same author is divided over this issue. Uh, but um, the, the, the interpretation favored today among Southeast Asian reformist Muslims is that there is no possibility of return and hence no possibility of possession by ancestral spirits. Uh, but I've already said that possession by spirits is, is generally uh, regarded as a possibility. So uh, in these circles as well, and then the logical conclusion is that uh, the possessing spirit must be erroneously defined as an, as, a, as an ancestor spirit and must be a different entity altogether. And the m most usual option is that it's an evil spirit, a shaitan, uh, that seeks to lead good Muslims astray by, by pretending to be an ancestral spirit. And here it's instructive to look at uh, fatwa, uh, uh, issued by the reformist Indonesian organization Muhammadiyah in 2010, quite recently, uh, which responds to the question whether spirits of the dead can roam this world, Gantayangan in, in Indonesian. And the answer is unequivocal. The spirits of the deceased have departed to the world of the Barzakh and can't ever return to this world. And then it cites uh, the, the same uh, textual uh, justification from the Quran. Um, but then the fatwa also notes that some people will quote a hadith, and it's well known, this hadith in Southeast Asia, to, in, in this context, that seems to contradict this. And here is the text of the hadith, which the fatwa also includes. You see the text. Um, I won't read it out all. You can, you can read the text. But you see that the, the, the spirit or soul of the dead will just remain for some longer or shorter periods around his house, around his grave, and so on. So there is some period when the spirit is still with us. Um, now, this hadith definitely uh, appears to allow interaction between the living and the spirits of the ancestors. However, the fatwa deals with this. Yeah, it's very recurrent in Jewish thought. Really? Yes. This idea of, of the soul. Uh, just circling around. Yes. Well, for, but for a certain amount of time, a I, week or, or a... I have been looking for similar hadiths, and this is the only one in, in, in the Muslim tradition. I haven't, I haven't come across a similar one. So then we have a likely source for that. Anyway, I don't know how old it is, but it is well known. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, it's, it's getting more interesting. <laughs> uh, now, it, it, it allows, or seems to allow, interaction. Uh, and then it, uh, the fatwa deals with this problem with casting doubt, and by casting doubt on the, the authenticity of the hadith. And uh, quite, it's, it's, it's quite, 21st century, uh, the way it does it, because uh, it, it states that searching digital databases such as Al Maktab al Shamila, Jami' al Akbar, and so on, uh, for this hadith has turned up no result. Um, I searched other sources as well, and it, it didn't turn up any result either. Um, and it says that therefore this hadith is inauthentic and shouldn't be taken into account. It's not authentic. One must conclude then, uh, according to the fatwa, that possession by ancestral spirits is impossible and the possessing entity, as I said, is a shaitan uh, instead, which pretends to be an ancestor. 
and then uh, uh, the textual basis for this. Uh, it must be uh, a shaitan, uh, an evil spirit, is this. We placed at their disposal evil associates who made their past and future misdeeds appealing to them, and so on. So these evil uh, associates, Qurana, uh, are supposed to be the spirits instead of the ancestral spirits who, who possess these people, according to the fatwa. And furthermore, a number of well-known hadiths also state that every human being has an accompanying spirit, a qarin min uh, uh, which must be, um, which must be uh, the possessing spirit. But here again, I must emphasize, I, I must stress that, that uh, uh, these texts, uh, the, in their original context, had nothing to do with, uh, with uh, possession by, uh, by ancestral spirits. So uh, no real connection there. It's, it's been created recently for the purposes of this, contro uh, this controversy. Um, now, this denial of the possibility of possession by, or any earthly activities by uh, ancestral spirits seems to be the consensus of uh, reformist Muslims, in, at least in Southeast Asia. Among other juridical and dogmatic problems, the same objection has been made by local reformist Muslims against the Mullah Bottumpe ritual, which I have shown you uh, pictures of. Um, and uh, uh, here again, the problem was that there is no possibility, or one of the main problems, one of the main, main objections was that there is no possibility of possession by ancestral spirits. Um, and this takes us to, uh, very briefly, really, uh, to another form of return of ancestral spirits or continuing activity in this world, which is uh, reincarnation. In, uh, and that's because in many Austronesian-speaking societies in Southeast Asia, as well as uh, the Pacific, it was a widespread belief that ancestral spirits are reborn in some of their uh, descendants. And for instance, uh, on, uh, on Bhutan Island in southeast Sulawesi, which is not very far by Indonesian standards, is not very far from the, uh, the spot uh, in which I, I did my, my field work. Uh, there are some ritual specialists uh, called uh, Pasuchu who are thought to be capable of predicting at a funeral uh, when and where the dead person's spirit will be reincarnated. Now, this, this Island was a sultanate. It has been Islamized in, in the 16th century, uh, or around the 16th century. So again, it's, it's not a recently Islamized society we are, uh, we are talking about. Um, and even among the, the uh, political elite of the sultanate, uh, the, the idea was widespread. And, and, and it appears even in written uh, works produced uh, by the elite of the sultanate, that some ancestors are reborn uh, in, in uh, the, uh, certain uh, descendants. And uh, even more interestingly, even the members of the modern reformist movement, the Muhammadiyah, which issued that fatwa I, I referred to, uh, tend to firmly believe in reincarn reincarnation in this uh, particular place. Um, and uh, they base their belief on a Quranic passage that I will mention shortly. Um, now, of course, unlike the issue of possession by ancestral spirits, uh, the question of the transmigration of souls uh, and reincarnation has medieval precedence quite a lot uh, in, in, in Islamic discourse as well. Uh, and it was discussed in some detail by medieval Muslim jurists and other scholars mainly because of the influence of uh, Indian religious ideas upon certain Muslim philosophers. But uh, the general view among, or the mainstream view among pre-modern Muslim jurists uh, seems to have been that the idea of uh, metempsychosis and reincarnation are incompatible with Islamic dogma. And then uh, it, it's, it's perhaps surprising to find that uh, this consensus doesn't exist in Southeast Asia uh, today or at least not in some parts of it. And uh, the, the textual justification for the idea of reincarnation here on Bhutan Island, which I have mentioned, is the following text. Uh, 
وترزق من تشاء بغير حساب. You bring forth the living from the dead and the dead from the living. And this is supposed to mean reincarnation and return uh, into this world. And there are other Quranic verses as well that suggest are suggestive, uh, suggestive of two deaths and two births for every individual. Um, but I've got no time for, uh, for uh, uh, discussing these. Uh, Muslim commentators, in any case, were obviously perplexed by the meaning of these verses have ha and, and have interpreted them in various ways, uh, such as the first death being equated with uh, the state of the human soul before birth, or else the second life being the state of the dead in the grave. But uh, the important thing is that the issue is obviously open to a range of interpretations, not just one. And uh, this possibility has been utilized uh, by some Muslims in Southeast Asia for this um, uh, purpose. And now I think um, I don't have that much time left, so I have to, uh, to turn back to go see her study and offer uh, uh, some conclusions uh, uh, to, uh, to round off my, my uh, discussion, my uh, talk. Now, as I've argued, uh, the pre-Islamic Arabs' beliefs uh, concerning the ancestors seem to, be, uh, to have been rudimentary and nebulous uh, if we judge them by uh, the standards of uh, of uh, the, uh, the material to be found in Goldseher's art article and other relevant uh, sources. And this could hardly serve as a coherent precedent to determine the Muslim scholarly approach to the issue of ancestor cults. And in fact, no emic, no indigenous terminology developed in Arabic for describing the complex issue of ancestral spirits and their veneration. So you, don't, you don't have a term that, describe, uh, that describes or would describe uh, the phenomenon of uh, ancestral cults. Um, and even though Hadith collections do discuss many ritual aspects of death, burial, and related issues in sections called Kitab al um, such as the issue of Tolkien, that's a very controversial thing, how you, uh, uh, the, when, you, when you sort of teach the dead uh, what to say to uh, the two angels of, uh, of, of the grave and so on. Uh, so there, there are ritual aspects of burial and death that are discussed, but there is precious little in these works that, that's applicable to the typical forms of uh, ancestor worship in Southeast Asian uh, and African societies, in, in Muslim ones. And because of this, uh, these newly, or relatively newly, Islamized societies had to find textual sources afresh on their own to discuss and decide on the juridical status of local beliefs and rituals concerning the ancestral spirits. There, there is no tradition to fall back on, or not a coherent, uh, there's no coherent tradition. One result uh, is, is a piecemeal discussion of certain aspects of ancestral cults instead of a holistic approach to the phenomenon. So you don't discuss in these circles, you don't discuss ancestral cults as such, but certain aspects of them in isolation. Another result was a sort of cherry picking of uh, Quranic and Hadith passages that seemed uh, to, uh, to be suitable for, uh, for being interpreted in ways relevant to the issue of ancestor cults. And these texts from Quran and Hadith would typically be removed from their original and very different context and transferred into a totally new one, a totally new background, um, which makes for a good deal of highly innovative tafsir, a remarkable aspect of the current discourse on ancestral spirits and their cults in these uh, regions. Uh, for instance, the Malaysian Sufi author I have already quoted claims that despite its generalized wording, uh, this condemnation in uh, Quran, Surah 26, uh, Ayahs 221 to 3, uh, is a reference to shamans, Bomo or Pawang. And uh, he says that that's because they tend to be the people frequently visited and possessed by spirits. So that's why this is, this is supposed to refer to them. 
so what one can observe here is an assumption, a big assumption, the assumption of unproblematic cultural translatability. Unrelated Arabic terms and concepts are identified with quite different local ones, regardless of the, uh, of the wider con cultural context. And I, I should only mention here uh, the term ruh, the Arabic term ruh, which uh, exists in all the languages of Southeast Asia in the form roh or arwa, the, the, the plural. And they are supposed, in, in many cases, they are supposed to mean the spirits of uh, the ancestors. Now, this is not the meaning that, that the term originally had uh, in, uh, in Arabic. Uh, and it's very problematic simply to equate the two, uh, which, is, which is done in a routine way. And this seems to illustrate a more general tendency, if, if I may say so, uh, forms of popular religion that had no precedent in Islamic, pre-Islamic or early Islamic Arabian traditions would typically allow for a great deal of ambiguity and offer more than usual room for widely different interpretations of religious sources, uh, especially the Quran and Hadith. And uh, often these wouldn't even be identified as coherent issues in the juridical literature. So this again leaves room for, uh, for negotiation. And the main, or perhaps the only way in which uh, the pre-Islamic Arabian notions about the ancestors that Goldsihar uh, describes seem to have contributed to later Muslim discourse in other parts of the world is, is, is by an absence, by their absence, by providing a sort of vacuum, uh, a, a sort of vacuum into which a lot of innovative uh, local tafsir uh, could flourish because of the absence of uh, obvious uh, precedents. And with that, I think I will bring this talk to a conclusion. And thank you for listening to me. If there are none, I would like to pose a question. Um, there is some difference between the attitude to a dead deceased person who died a natural death and the person who was murdered. Now, a person who was murdered has certain rights in relation to his, survive, to his survivors, such as the, the obligation to take revenge. Now, is there any connection between these, these two types of deceased persons? <laughs> hey, uh, this is actually briefly uh, remarked uh, by what's here. It's, it's, it's a very well-known uh, idea and that... that you this is this is supposed to work. Close. Oh, okay. It's just a matter of distance. Uh, so uh, I think I think uh, uh, the point that you mentioned is is is, a, is very relevant and it's, it's it's very important because that uh, that has ritual aspects as well as as practical aspects. You have to uh, to Revenge to, to uh, you have to to get revenge for a, a murdered person, but also there was the uh, associated idea that uh, the murdered person from his body a, a sort of small uh, bird uh, came out um, um, and it was called the henna and and it would it would stay around the grave and every one hundred year. Uh, years return to the grave uh, until it was uh, it was um, uh, avenged. So uh, here uh, here is 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 one one uh, uh, instance of uh, of a uh, uh, of a belief or a, an idea that that we can we can interpret in various ways. Uh, so here. Here you do see that uh, the, the descendants have a, a certain obligation to uh, to uh, their their murdered relatives, but then I, I would really hesitate to call this belief a, a, a sort of ancestor cult because I don't think that uh, that um, that um, 
in, in such an immediate situation, you have to avenge the death of someone who might be your brother, might be your 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 cousin, and so on. Uh, you have to avenge these people as well. So you can't talk about the the ancestors in such situations. So I don't think that it's it's, pro it, it's a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting and ritually rich uh, complex of beliefs. But I don't think, in the proper sense, this could be this could be char characterized as, as as a sort of ancestor cult. Sure. Any other? I have a question. I'm, I'm curious you know, if you can find me a parallel to this. You know that in the North African uh, culture, the cult of the death is very, very uh, important. Not only in the Muslim, but also by Jews coming from these countries, also in Israel. So one of the expressions that I heard many years ago, quite remarkable expression, uh, defining the content, you know, the wedding wall, calling it signal content, our Lord the content. A lady told me, I'm going to pray in signal content. Now, what I saw in this is a personification of a place of pilgrimage. And I tried to, I when I heard it for the first time, I tried to find whether I, there is a, a, any resemblance, any parallel to such a phenomenon that you call just as if you say, say that to the car. We go to, do you have, is, do you know something similar to the personification of a place in which there is no self which is buried, but still you call it our Lord the place without without any anybody buried? Uh, in more recent periods, I think it's it's a very widespread phenomenon in the Arab world as well, especially in North Africa. If you if you, uh, there is this magisterial work, uh, work by by Western Mark. About uh, Morocco, that's full of these uh, examples, the personifications of certain places of pilgrimage. Or uh, I think the sweetest one was was uh, a, a saint called Sidon Hamadul Haram, which is on the seaside. No, but there is you suppose that there is somebody there, but without a body, without a person, I mean, there whether there is a personification or I don't person. There is no body there. there that's what uh, Western Mark says. That, that it, 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 it seems to have been a some sort of nature shrine, and then it was personified. But whether or not there is anyone uh, in, in that uh, particular shrine, I can say that uh, the the material to be found in those years, uh, article, or should I say articles, uh, because he, he also has a very important article about the cult of saints. Uh, um, and and I don't recall any single uh, example of the personification of, uh, of a place like the Kaaba or any other uh, religiously important uh, place. But, but then I might I might forget examples. I don't think there is any any, any comparable material in that. 